everyone. Happy Thursday. Welcome to Within the Frame, where we delve deeper into the top stories taking place not only in South Korea, but across the globe. I'm Kim bo -kyung. Last September, the 32-year-old Jeon Ju hwan who the media has dubbed the Shindang Station stalker killer, allegedly stabbed his female colleague in the ladies' room at Shindang Station in Seoul. The prosecution recently asked the court for the death penalty. His sentence hearing is set for February 7th. However, even if he gets that sentence, he will not be executed as South Korea is classified as an abolitionist in practice country. Then if Jeon does get the heaviest penalty, what would happen to him? One more issue is which pictures of a suspect can be unveiled by the police. The identity of a 31-year-old man who is accused of killing a taxi driver and his ex-girlfriend was unveiled in the hope of finding more information. But the suspect refused to have his mugshot revealed, so the police could only reveal, release the picture on his driving license, which is reportedly very different from his actual appearance. For an in-depth analysis on South Korea's death penalty and matter on unveiling suspect's identity, we invited Professor Song se from Kyung University Law School on the line from Portland. Professor Song, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Welcome. And we also have Lee Hyun, professor from Handong International Law School on the line from Pohang. Professor Lee, thank you for your time. Well, thanks for having me. All right, Professor Song, South Korea still technically has capital punishment, keeping death penalty under Article 41 of the Criminal Code. But it is classified as an abolitionist in practice country with the last execution taking place in 1997. Why no actual executions since then? Well, you could say that there is a global trend against uh, uh, death penalty. And also in our society as well, there is a, a move towards uh, uh, abolishment of the uh, death row, uh, uh, death penalty. Now, uh, there's only two countries in the OECD uh, members uh, that uh, still has a, a, a death penalty practice, which is uh, uh, Japan and United States. And the de death penalty is mostly exercised in in the Middle East and uh, half of the, the Asian countries. Uh, most, almost all European countries have outright uh, abolished it, and almost all American countries have abolished outright, or in fact. Uh, and African countries as well have uh, mostly abolished th this. So there is a clear uh, the global trend to it. I think the reason could be that the realization that, or the sentiment, that the death penalty is a cruel and un unusual punishment in 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 its uh, origin and also well, there's a doubt as to whether judicial killing is justified and since there's a lifetime incarceration is available uh, do we need to really resort to uh, death penalty which is very final and unreversible and in our society as well uh, I could just point to to, uh, to uh, the con constitutional uh, court of deliberation on this in 1996, it was a 7 to 2 in favor of death penalty, but in 2010, it was merely 5 to 4. And the third one was deliberated uh, last year, and they have not announced it. Uh, but uh, clearly, there's a kind of a movement towards uh, uh, abolishing the death penalty in this society as well. Right, so there is a global trend because of many reasons, including the cruelty. I would also like to look quickly at the pros and cons of the death penalty, Professor Song again. The Constitutional Court revisited the death penalty policy in 2019, petitioned by a man surnamed Yoon, who is convicted of killing his parents. His attorneys say there is no concrete research that proves the death penalty actually helps lower crime levels. How do you see its effect as a deterrent? Well, at this point, that, that d debate has been going on uh, for decades. Uh, of course, you could point to episodic uh, kind of evidences who uh, favor the death penalty. For example, Japan and Singapore has the lowest murder rate, and they have the death penalty. And you could point to uh, Texas, the state of Texas in the United States, uh, who reintroduced their death penalty and saw a dramatic reduction of the, the murder rate. But those are episodic, and there are many other uh, factors that go into the, the, to, uh, to determine whether there's a, 
a concrete deterrence factor. I, I think that the researchers have shown that it's either inconclusive or uh, it does not really clearly show that the death penalty has a deterrence factor. And at this point, I think it's always been a balancing act as to whether the society needs to protect itself uh, by removing a member uh, permanently. Uh, and there is a human rights factor for uh, the, even the convicted uh, felons as well. So that uh, balancing has uh, shifted around, but because of the deterrence is, uh, as the scholars would say, uh, inconclusive, which includes the Korean debate uh, last year, uh, who brought in the expert uh, from the, the law school uh, faculty, and he also uh, opined that, that the, given the evidences that are inconclusive around the world, he could not express uh, one way or the other whether the deterrence is there or not. So uh, I, I think that that discussion, uh, uh, hotly debated and uh, going on for decades, probably it would not show that deterrence uh, is permanently attached to the death penalty itself. Right. Now, Professor Lee, one of other reasons for not actually executing those sentenced to death was because of the possibility of an incorrect guilty verdict. Now, how often does this happen statistically? Right. So you're referring to something called wrongful, wrongful conviction. And, uh, and also when someone is actually on death row or they're subject to the death penalty, uh, if they're found actually later to be not guilty of the crime, they're, they're eventually exonerated. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, if you look around the world, the very few countries actually keep official statistics on sort of wrongful conviction rates. And so it's a bit hard to sort of look at this sort of globally because of the inconsistencies between countries in terms of keeping these, these kinds of statistics. But uh, one country that has sort of kept sort of a rate of statistics for these kinds of situations is the United States. And as Professor Song mentioned, uh, you have a state like Texas or other states in the United States that actually apply the death penalty on a regular basis. Uh, but looking at the United States as a whole, since 1973, uh, there have been about 190 uh, formerly convicted uh, suspect or people who've been on death row that were ex eventually exonerated. They were wrongfully convicted. Now, if you look at that number, 190, you have to see it in context. And so about one th about 1,500 people have been sentenced to death and were actually put to death in the United States. So putting those two numbers together, what you'll see is a one out of every eight persons in the United States uh, who was on death row were, was wrong, wrongfully convicted. And so uh, this, of course, is a you know potentially disturbing number, given that if you are on death row, there is the possibility that you were wrongfully convicted. And so this leads to part of the debate about whether or not the death penalty should be in place or, or not around the world. Right, right. Uh, Professor Lee, one more. According to a report from the Death Penalty Information Center, many executions uh, this year were botched in the United States, meaning lethal injections uh, inflicted torture on death row inmates. I mean, this kind of fallout from wrong pr procedures could make not only the inmates, but also the witnesses, families, and uh, correction personnel suffer as well. Now, how many such cases occur? Right. So uh, statistically speaking, and again, you know, the statistics can vary uh, depending on who you're talking to. But one of the leaders, lead research, leading researchers on this issue sort of did a sort of systematic study uh, actually going back to like 1890. Uh, and going up to 2010 and trying to examine, you know, where there was a botched execution. And you made reference to this in, the, in your question, particularly in terms of lethal injections. You know, did, did the executioner follow the protocols or did they somehow mess up and therefore lead to a situation where the, the person being executed had sort of took a while to die? And so in this situation, you know, the idea here is the person who's subject to execution is going to suffer unnecessarily. And generally the idea, of course, is to make this as quick as possible, as painless as possible, uh, leading to the uh, convicted person's death. Uh, but in the United States, the idea, the, the sense is that about 3% of, of 
U.S. executions has led to some sort of mistake during the execution process. And so this, of course, as you alluded to in your question, leads to a, a, a lot of trauma, of course, not just to the person, of course, being executed themselves, who eventually dies as a result of this, but for the people witnessing the events themselves and, and leads to, I, I guess, a, a general sense that uh, that since these executions don't happen in an in a orderly fashion, that this is something which needs to be looked at very closely because it leads to this traumatic experience for those who are witnessing these events. Right, traumatic experience indeed. Now, Professor Song, apart from the issue of human dignity or justice, I heard that there are some voices that say the constitutional court should not be the one to decide the legality of capital punishment because there is no clause that clearly states that. What is this about? Well, uh we, we have uh, the death penalty on the books in a criminal uh, code, but in the Constitution itself, there is a mention of death penalty in the context of uh, military uh, uh, sentencing, uh, but it does not uh, directly uh, uh, mention uh, whether it's constitutionally uh, sanctionable or not. So the debate uh, goes on as to whether that uh, clause is uh, legal or not. Uh, but I, I, I think that uh, because the, the Constitution could be construed as uh, ha uh, uh, sanctioning the form of uh, 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 execution or the form of punishment in various degrees, uh, I, I think that that debate is only a debate uh, so far. I think a more important question is whether the criminal code that uh, specify the death penalty is uh, against uh, the the constitution and that has to bring uh, the uh, the factors that we talked about uh, and uh, make it a kind of a con con uh, conclusive and 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 very hard uh, solid uh, constitutional arguments so that has not taken place yet Right. Now, though Professor Song briefly talked about this uh, in the previous question, Professor Lee, I'd like to uh, tap on this again. This is the third time the Constitutional Court is reviewing the legitimacy of death penalty. What were the previous verdicts? Right. So, uh, as Professor Song had early mentioned, uh, there were two cases previously, one in 1996 and the other in 2010. And in, in both cases, the Supreme, uh, the Constitutional Court ruled on the constitutionality that upheld the death penalty in, in Korean law. And in the first case, in, in 1996, it was a 7-2 decision. And then in, in 2010, it was a 5-4 decision. And so the, the, the idea, of course, is that there's a trend towards maybe this this third time around, uh, the Constitution, Constitutional Court will then finally rule that the death penalty would be uh, unconstitutional under, under Korean law. And, you know, the, the reference earlier that was made to the Constitution itself, uh, you know, in passing, of course, the, the Constitution makes reference to the death penalty in Article 110 of the Constitution as it relates to uh, military uh, trials. Uh, but that necessarily is not necessarily a specific endorsement, but it may be an implicit endorsement of the death penalty. But uh, as Professor Song mentioned, you know, really the question boils down to this issue about within the criminal code, whether or not, because the current code allows for the death penalty for uh, crimes, uh, whether or not that will be ultimately held to be constitutional or not. So uh, really, I mean, that's what we're all waiting for is the constitutional court to make a decision. And there has to be six justices in this context to rule on its unconstitutionality if it's to be held unconstitutional under Korean law. Right. Now, Professor Lee, uh, shifting gears a little bit, interestingly, though the Justice Ministry in South Korea is in favor of death penalty, the UN administration voted in favor of the resolution of the moratorium on death penalties uh, during the UN General Assembly, which was held last December. Now, how should we think about this discrepancy and where is South Korea aiming to go right now regarding this issue? Right. As you mentioned before, you know, Korea is abol abolitionist in practice. And so while that means, of course, that Korea has the death penalty on the books, uh, it has not 
it effectively ha has put a moratorium on the actual application of the death penalty. So uh, the, the death penalty has not been actually put into place for, for many, many years in Korea. And so I think what you're seeing here from the UN administration is sort of straddling the fence on, on this issue. Uh, so while indicating that, you know, we we do have the death penalty on the books. Uh, it's still something that's viable uh, under Korean law, but we have not uh, put it into practice. And so what I suspect may be happening here is uh, there are, of course, calls from within the Korean public as a whole. So, I mean, looking at public opinion polls, while they have been generally favoring and tending towards abolishing the death penalty, a good number of people in Korea still believe in the death penalty, particularly for very heinous crimes. And so, uh, you know, this is the idea, of course, that when a, a really terrible crime happens, uh, something that is just shocks the public conscience, I think people do really feel the idea, that, that the concept or the principle that, you know, the, the, the murderer who has taken someone's life or many lives for that matter, you know, should be really subject to the death penalty. And I think the public really has a sense of, of justice in that regard. And so I think in the Korean context, uh, there is the sense that the public still favors it, favors it to some degree in really egregious cases. And so I think this is where the, the UN administration is holding the line, that saying that the, the Korean government doesn't practice it, but we will reserve it in, in principle. Right. Uh, of course, public sentiment is not the one that we can leave out when discussing such kind of uh, subject. Now, Professor Song, how many death row inmates in that case are there currently in South Korea? And I wonder what happens to them because, like we are saying right now, South Korea is a abolitionist in practice country. And one more, if the death penalty is ruled uh, either entirely or partially unconstitutional, what's going to happen? Well, there are uh, currently 59 uh, death row inmates in Korea, and it'll depend on whether the death penalty is uh, held unconstitutional or not. Uh, defense attorneys could make an argument that if it is partially or entirely uh, found unconstitutional, then since their incarceration is based on the, you know, waiting for the execution, the, the reason for the imprisonment that goes away, so they should be freed. I think they could make that argument, but in practice, I think that uh, they would say that uh, the the underlying crime is still found guilty, and the only the form of the punishment is at issue. So uh, until the new legislation goes in effect and they are reviewed and assigned a new punishment, they could be simply ordered to uh, uh, ha have arrested and be still in the the incarceration. I think that's what happened in South Africa when that issue came up in that country. So uh, in that sense, nothing much would change uh, for their uh, the status because uh, even though death row inmates are waiting for the execution, they have not taken place, as you mentioned, uh, since 1997. And uh, no immediate uh, execution is expected at this point. Right. Professor Song, thank you for clearing that out for us. Now, Professor Song, one more question to you. Along with death penalty issue, one other controversial issue is revealing a suspect's identity. Now, there, are, though there are several cases where the identity has been revealed, I heard it should go through a committee's decision to weigh the public's right to know against the suspect's right not to be exposed. Now, what elements do they consider when making such decision? Uh, again, in, in the past, the, the identity was not really an issue. People uh, uh, usually saw the faces of the perpetrators on TV, but uh, since the, the sentiment or their recognition for the human rights have been uh, heightened in Korea, uh, it became a balancing act uh, between the public's, uh, public interest to know whether there's a potential threat uh, uh, in, in the society, uh, their right to know, as opposed to the human rights or the people's right, even for the convicted felons. So the, the committee uh, looks at elements such as how serious the crime, uh, whether there were the sufficient evidence to pinpoint uh, the perpetrator, the degree of public value of the disclosure, 
and the deterrence factor, and they they look at the age of the the uh, the convicted felon. Uh, we don't disclose the information of someone under 19 uh, years old of age. So uh, those are the the factors, and it ultimately uh, goes to the, the, those balancing acts. And now the problem is uh, because we don't have one single uh, uh, committee and the, the committee membership kind of shifts from time to time. So the consistency of the decisions have been questioned so far. I think that they should be uh, more uh, studied and made into a guidance so that uh, the, the consistent uh, level of uh, disclosure is established. But uh, that's the only uh, homework we have, I think. Right. I think this question is in line with what uh, Professor Song said about the consistency. But Professor Lee, even if the name, face, and age is unveiled, they are, there are voices that say the police mugshots should also be provided for the people to know, not the photo of the suspect's ID card or passport. Now, what is your takeaway on this? Right. So unlike in, in a jurisdiction, jurisdiction like the United States that would reveal the mugshot of an alleged suspect, uh, in, in Korea, and as well as in terms of law and also the practice of the media in terms of their policies, uh, they you know, generally protect the identity of the criminal suspect. And so uh, in accordance with Korean law, particularly, uh, there is an act on special cases concerning the punishment of specific filing crimes. And that particular law uh, designates the, the disclosure of uh, certain factors, right? That uh, as Professor Song referenced, this committee that will look at different factors in terms of revealing the identity and, and so the picture of, of the person who's been uh, subject to an allegation of a crime. And uh, because we, we have a law in place that has specific guidelines, you know, th that, that's why, you know, regularly we don't see on Korean media a mugshot, you know, that's been put on television uh, that identifies uh, the, the person in terms of their face on, on, on in the media. Uh, but also, you know, there's also another point to this as well. You know, the, there's sensitivities in Korea, of course, with respect to privacy. And, you know, the idea is that if you release a picture, even a picture of a person uh, that is accused of a crime, you know, what if it, it may be improbably, but they are not found to be innocent, right? And they are going to have uh, really some stigma attached to them if their picture gets on the media and then, of course, is spread through SNS and other, other forms of social media. And, you know, that's going to be there for a long, long time. And so uh, their face will be associated with this uh, allegation. And therefore, you know, the idea here is, you know, this is going to stay with them for the rest of their lives, potentially. So uh, this is the balance, I think, that is being had in this discussion about whether the public's right to know it, with respect to the identity of the person and their picture versus, of course, the privacy of the individual who's been been accused of a crime. Right. Very difficult issue to be to solve indeed. Now, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's edition. But thanks to both of our experts for sparing time for us. Thank you, Professor Song, and thank you, Professor Lee, for your insights. We really appreciate it. A pleasure. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All right, that's all for Within the Frame tonight. We will be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories on the issues happening in South Korea and, of course, around the globe. Enjoy your Thursday, and thank you for watching. Goodbye.